<clears throat> Hi there. How very musical of me. Welcome to Slurp. If you're not aware, Slurp is a little series here in the Kick the PJ universe. My hands are a little bit out of control right now. Please stop. Where you throw me your questions, I answer those questions. All while slurping a delicious beverage. Today's Slurp theme is Phil. Not only is it film themed, but I've teamed up with the British Association for Screen Entertainment who are running the Movie Weekender campaign, which is celebrating watching films from the warmth and comfort of your living room. Specifically, films on DVD, Blu-ray, and digital download. As you probably know, I love to make films, but I also love to watch films. And, oh man, as a complete antisocial mole rat of a human being <laughs> in these sub-zero Brighton temperatures, I love nothing more than curling up on the sofa with a gigantic blanket, a hot cup of green tea, and watching my favorite film. So I'm all about this campaign. And so to kick off this slurp, PJ, what five films did you love this 2017? Oh boy. Okay, so in no particular order, Don't Breathe. Don't Breathe is a horror film about these three robbers who break into this blind man's house and then get trapped when it turns out that what he lacks in vision, he makes up for in every other sense. Okay, so I watched this film with a group of friends, and let me tell you, that is the way to watch this film. We switched off all the lights, we crowded around the TV, and usually when I'm watching a film, I like to just sit in silence and absorb everything. But with Don't Breathe, everybody was being super vocal, and it just kind of enhanced the experience. Now, I'm not gonna spoil this film because you need to go into it barely knowing anything. All I'll say is that it's an incredibly fun and refreshingly unique take on a horror film. I just really like throughout the whole film, you don't know exactly who you should be rooting for. Because everyone in this film is kind of a scumbag, but then they all have their individual reasons for acting the way they do. So there's a lot more depth to the film than you initially may assume. La La Land. La La Land is this modernized musical romantic comedy about Seb and Mia who fall in love whilst trying to achieve their dreams in Los Angeles. And then the film explores the ups and downs of balancing their relationship with their careers. Now, I know this film came out in 2016, but it came out on DVD this year, so I'm counting it. Out of all the many film genres, musical romantic comedies are probably my least favorite. <laughs> so, I was very pleasantly surprised when I ended up falling in love with La La Land. The story was really sweet, it has Ryan Gosling in it. The score was really catchy, it has Ryan Gosling in it. And you can really just tell this is a passion project that Damien Chazelle has been trying to desperately make for so long. And also, um, oh yeah, it has Ryan Gosling in it. He's a really pretty guy. Just putting that out there. Get Out is the next film I want to talk about. Get Out is a film about this young interracial couple who go to visit the girlfriend's parents' estate that's secluded deep in the countryside. Sounds like a wholesome family film, right? Yeah, it's a psychological horror film. <laughs> it has smatterings of comedy throughout, but it's more a social thriller horror than anything else. And I love it so much. Get Out's not only been my favorite film of 2017, but it's one of the best films I've seen for such a long time. I went into this film completely blind. I knew nothing about it. And again, that is the way to watch this film. Don't watch the trailer, just watch the film. As soon as I saw it, I knew that this was a film that I had to physically own because I just knew that it was gonna be something that would get better on repeat viewings and it does. And I also knew it'd be a film that I was gonna show to people endlessly, which I have. This was Jordan Peele's first feature film and he did such an amazing job. I truly hope we get more original concepts like Get Out, not only from Jordan Peele, but from other filmmakers as well. It was really smartly executed and it was incredibly fun when it needed to be and it was also incredibly horrific when it needed to be. Dunkirk. This is the story of Dunkirk where Belgium, British and French soldiers were surrounded by the German armies during World War II and they were trying to be evacuated. My experience with Dunkirk. Wow. I'm the kind of person who usually avoids watching film trailers. This would have been a film where I think I would have benefited from watching the trailer. I went into it knowing it was Christopher Nolan's new film, and I'm a huge, huge fan of Christopher Nolan, but I didn't realize that this was going to be a telling of the story of Dunkirk. I don't know how I didn't put two and two together. So I soon discovered this wasn't going to be a fictional war film with some crazy Nolan concept and deep character development. So instead, I left the film really appreciating how it was all put together, the way Christopher Nolan told the story through really distressing sound design, painting 
painting this perfect picture of what it would have been like to be there. I'm not gonna lie, it was a stressful watch, but a good kind of stressful, you know? I can't imagine anyone other than Christopher Nolan making this film, so it is definitely a film everybody should watch. Finally, The Big Sick. The Big Sick is about the comedian Kumail Nanjiani falling in love with Emily Gardner, but as they begin a relationship, this culture clash between them starts to unfold. Then Emily contracts some mysterious illness, which leads Kumail to grow closer to Emily's parents. I only very recently saw The Big Sick because I missed it in the cinema, but it very quickly became my second favorite film this year. It was in fact written by Kumail Nanjiani and his wife Emily, and it's such an incredibly genuine and endearing and heartfelt story that it feels so real. And that's because it is. The events of the film are things that actually happen to Kamail and Emily. A big reason I love this film is because I'm a huge fan of Kamail Nanjiani. As a comedian, his dry, deadpan humor and delivery just floors me every time. I have never been on the verge of crying from both intense laughter and deep, deep sadness at the same time before. And somehow, this film managed to draw that emotion out of me, which is very rare. So there we go. That's my top five. And I really want as many people to see these films as possible. So at the end of the video, I'm gonna do a little bit of a giveaway. I have some spare copies of all these films, so keep on watching and I'll explain how that's gonna work. <sighs> Woo! That was a gigantic slurp. Let's keep going. Scarlet Hope asks, what got you into filmmaking? The story is as simple as a young kid who loved to watch films and TV. I'm not sure why I'm talking in the third person here. But he started playing around with his dad's camera, recording random things and learning to cut them together in the camera and then showing them to his family. I'm gonna stop talking in the third person now, it's really weird. And then I would just show what I made to my family and my friends. And then I just started making the dumbest little sketches ever with my friends. And then I just knew that I wanted to keep doing that. It's weird. Kat asks, have you ever had an idea for a film that you really, really loved, only to discover that somebody had already done it? I think this is a very common thing in the ideas process of making stuff. I once thought of a cool idea for a film about this town that had become overridden with ghosts. And so this group of people who were especially good at catching ghosts decided to make a little business out of it, out of busting ghosts. It was, it was Ghostbusters. I'd, I'd thought of the idea, I just thought of the idea of Ghostbusters. <laughs> I'd probably seen it like a week before. It's not plagiarism if you scrap the whole idea when you realize it's plagiarism. <laughs> Anna Garner asks, which of your films was the hardest to bring into creation? I like the way you phrased that question, Hannah, because my answer is Ocean King. It was an animation I made in October, and the process of making the animation wasn't that difficult. It was transforming the idea into something you could watch that was difficult. I had the idea for Ocean Kid five years ago, and I've been constantly trying to develop it into something, and I've been through every style, live action, animation, stop motion, a book, a musical, I don't know. It's one of those passion projects that you love, but it's really hard to to realize it. And so I just thought, look, if I'm ever gonna start telling this story, I need to start with something. So I started small with an animation that almost resembles a sort of animatic look with the idea of now taking that and expanding it into what I've always wanted to make. It is still an ambition of mine to make what I'm calling the boy in the bonsai one day. Tanya Huff asks, what's your favorite angle? Oh, Dutch tilt all the way. It just makes everything so dramatic. Except when you use it for every other shot in your film. Then we gotta, we gotta talk. 92 Caterpillars have asked, what is that like 92 Caterpillars have crawled on the keyboard and typed out the message? We'll never know. If you could choose a movie to replace all the characters with asparagus, which movie would you choose? Hmm. I would probably go with something like Toy Story. So then it's no longer an endearing story about this innocent kid playing with toys. It's then about this strange little boy who plays with rotting vegetables and refuses to throw them away. And then the asparagus becomes sentient and goes on adventure. That's not a bad idea, actually. Might, uh, <laughs> might write that one down and then immediately throw it away. <laughs> and finally, fellow YouTuber and internet tat reviewer Stuart Ashens has asked me, what do you think of the story of Ricky? So Ricky O, the story of Ricky is a film. <laughs> it sort of falls into the category of best worst films ever made. I remember Chris Kendall introduced me to this film. One night I went around his house and we stayed up all night watching The Room, Troll 2, and then Ricky O. And it was, 
an experience. <laughs> the thing that separates Riccio from something like The Room is that Riccio has such an amazing level of production value. They really, really went to town on this film. It's like a martial arts film, but with so much action and so many crazy prosthetics and blood, so much blood. <laughs> it's a really, really fun film, and you can tell that a lot of heart went into it. And I would say they got a pretty damn good film out of it. That's what I'm saying, that's what I'm saying. So, that's all I'm saying. <sighs> and so that concludes this episode of Slurp. The Slurp gods are pleased once again. I hope you enjoyed this video. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I freaking love just talking about film and making films and watching films. So please do give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. And so, like I said, I want to give away a copy of the five films that I was talking about earlier. So if you want to win some films, just comment down below what's been your favorite film this year. And then I'll just pick someone at random and send you the film. Cool. Stay rad, everybody. I'm going to go turn myself into a blanket burrito with a cup of green tea and watch Get Out. Bye!